Okay guys, so today we're here in Wichita, Kansas, checking out the Global 7500 Test Program, Bombardier's new business jet. It's the world's largest purpose-built business jet. So this thing is just designed for you know, people who are, are flying places for business, for pleasure. It's not an airliner, it's just this large jet to get you places. And now we're gonna to talk to some of the test pilots, flight test engineers, look at how this flight test program works, how they get a plane like this from this to a certified airplane. We have five airplanes in the program. FTV-5, the most recent, the newest flight test vehicle. So it's got some of the same features as one does, which is like sort of initial handling quality type stuff. You've got a little bumper to the tail so that uh, you can measure like minimum unstuck speed and things like that that require getting the tail really close to the ground. Um, so that way it doesn't damage the tail or you know if you're about to hit the tail, things like that. It's got a uh, attitude recovery to recover from things like spins or deep stall. Uh, it's got a uh, trailing cone up on top of the tail. Uh, so that's basically just this like static port in this cone that uh, trails out behind the airplane so that you can measure static pressure uh, to validate with the uh, aircraft. It has a water ballast system, so you'll see this is a water tank, that's a water tank. So there's two more tanks at the rear. You can move the CG. Uh, some days you'll go out and you'll have a test card that tells you you need to fly a, an aft CG point and then you have to do a mid to forward CG point and it allows you to do it on the same flight. You don't have to rebalance the, the airplane. Uh, so you can depressurize the airplane. Those are the flaps that would open to do it. So basically with these pins removed, there's a, there's a latch in the cockpit that allows you to pop that flap open and depressurize it. It's also for egress as well. So if we had to egress, if we were in a deep stall, and, and that was it, the airplane was unrecoverable and we called for a bailout. Those will pop open as well, as well as the egress doors. Those tubes go out to fuel tanks and they sniff uh, O2 and nitrogen levels, so that's how we get that data. Flight test engineer can push additional data uh, to the cockpit. This currently is a wind readout, so it's reading our weather station outside and showing where the wind dot is relative to the airplane's heading. I'm Ed Grabman. I'm the uh, uh, project pilot for the Global 7500 here at Bombardier. So what that means is um, I'm the lead pilot on, on the program. I've been on it for a couple of years. We have a team of uh, about uh, a dozen pilots that have flown the aircraft uh, in the test program. We'll start out by uh, being participating in the design reviews with engineering, uh, particularly the things that uh, affect um, the interaction between the pilot and the system, if you will, all of the displays, all of the controls, the switches, um, the functionality. Uh, so after that, um, we'll, we enter the phase of actually flying, we'll be involved with test planning. And so we have a very uh, detailed script for everything that we do in the air. Um, every test that we do beforehand, we uh, conduct or, or we arrange it in a, what's called a TDS, a test plan basically, if you will. Uh, which details exactly how we're going to conduct the test in the air. So there's a lot of review, there's a lot of back and forth that involves engineering, it involves pilots, it involves flight test engineers. Once uh, that is nailed down and settled, if you will, then uh, we uh, participate in the brief beforehand where we go um, in detail exactly what we're going to do step by step when we get in the air. That's our plan, if you will, for the day. Uh, and then We'll, we'll go fly the flight with a crew. It's typically a crew of three. We operate these airplanes with uh, typically two pilots and at least one flight test engineer. Sometimes we'll have additional uh, crew on board, uh, another flight test engineer or another systems engineer if need be. Everybody works as a team to execute um, the test that we have for that day. Uh, and the testing could be anything from uh, handling qualities, uh, aerodynamics, it could be you know, high-speed dives, for example, it could be um, systems tests for uh, various different uh, uh, components that we have on the aircraft, um, it could be performance, you know, there's just a, a, a zillion different things. And so, like, what is so this monitoring? It's still a flight test bird. So we still, when we were flying this, we were still building confidence in, in all the systems. So you still have all the monitoring and data recording 
and now it's been specialized for interior testing. Depending on the uh, testing we're doing, okay. there'll be uh, microphones placed around as if somebody's sitting in seats or, um, and then you'll have thermocouples measuring the cabin, uh, cabin zones for heating and cooling, making sure it's an even distribution. You know, I think a lot of people have this idea of like test pilots, as, you know, like these crazy guys Cowboys. in the 40s, yeah. you know, just yeah. trying to go faster yeah. than the next guy. Right. What, how do you, you know, keep things safe? You know, obviously you've got exactly. these, like, these limits here and there. What are some other yeah. ways of, you know, safety? So, kind of... yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's not, you know, just let's, hey, see what we can do today. It, it's it's uh, very structured. Even before we get in the airplane, there's extensive data reviews. Uh, there's you know, design reviews, there's uh, safety of flight reviews where we talk about um, you know, what are the possibilities, what could go wrong, what has gone wrong on previous programs or previous tests like this, and how are we going to do that different so that we don't get too far you know, and get into trouble. What are, you know, what are, what are the contingency plans? What if something does go wrong? What if you, you know, get into a spin that you can't recover from? Whenever you take an, an untested aircraft to its limits, you're never 100% sure what's going to happen. And so for those type of tests that are particularly hazardous, we have certain safety systems on the aircraft. Uh, the first safety system is the crew itself and knowing uh, what to knock it off so that we don't take too big of a bite or too, too big of a chunk into the unknown so that we have that good trend so that you can see if, if there's a, a, you know, less damping or less control in a certain axis that you can actually stop before you get to a point you can't control it. However, um, if there is a problem, we have uh, on the test airplanes that we do that type of testing on, we have some uh, safety systems. Uh, for hazardous tests, we'll be wearing a personal parachute. We have the aircraft modified for uh, with two egress doors, one on the forward and one on the aft part of the cabin. And those are non-production type doors that uh, are opened with nitrogen so you can actuate a switch. It immediately opens the door in the aircraft so that if you actually had an unrecoverable, unrecoverable situation, the crew could get out. Um, even before that, uh, those same airplanes, they have an attitude recovery chute, which is a anti-spin chute, if you will. It's on the tail. Uh, it's a parachute that can be deployed from the cockpit, and uh, it's a mortar-driven parachute. So the, uh, if actuated, uh, a mortar drives the parachute out, extends it, which will cause the nose to come down and uh, get back more within uh, alpha and beta uh, limits that you can be controllable. Once the aircraft is controllable again, you can deploy that chute and recover the aircraft. Of course, none of this testing would matter if you couldn't record all the data to tell what worked and what didn't. You know, this airplane itself has over 60,000 parameters we can we can pull and monitor actively at any given at any given time. Most of our test aircraft have telemetry where we're sending data down for the engineers who aren't on the aircraft to kind of say, yeah, that, that test point went the way I wanted it to, or can you change this and do it again? So I'm uh, Derek Thresher. I'm a member of the BFTC Bombardier Flight Test Center uh, test pilots here. I'm one of the test pilots here, and I've been working on the Global 7500 for the last two years. So I've mainly been assigned to 70,003, which is the Agonix test aircraft. So I've uh, gone and tested all of the avionic functions within the uh, within the aircraft. I've got moving map, the displays, uh, all the approaches, the FMS, uh, all of those sort of things to try and uh, find all the problems, fix them, and get a great product out to the, uh, the customers. So sometimes you, know, you run into ATC constraints, like yeah. That so or... airspace around here is is a challenge, especially when we're trying to fly in commercial airspace, where. For majority, actually, for the entire program, we were we were not RVSM approved. So you're now trying to fly in RVSM airspace as a non-RVSM aircraft. So that brings its challenges uh, for air traffic and for us. Um, air traffic here do a wonderful job and a great job, and sometimes it's just not a it's not a, an option to allow us into their airspace due thunderstorm to the north of, the, of uh, Wichita, and everything's being funneled through through here or down south, and, and it just makes it. Uh, 
difficult to do. There is airspace around here that we can reserve. There's a couple of mowers around here, military operating areas that we can request to use, uh, but that's at the whim of the military. If they're using it, then we can't use it. What would you say is kind of the breakdown between like time spent flying and time spent doing paperwork and other things? Sure, and th th that all depends. It, it depends uh, at what stage of the program you're in. You know, very early on in the program, especially when you've got no aircraft to fly, there's, there's no flying going on and it's all it's all meetings, paperwork, getting ready for, for, for to, when we do go fly. Um, at the height of the program, you know, I was getting, I'd get 50 to 60 hours in a month, uh, which was which is a good month to tell you the truth. Normally it'd be 30 to 40, somewhere around there. And some weeks I would fly every day, some weeks I wouldn't fly at all. So it all depends on really what stage of the program you're at. So, but yeah, majority of the time, it's not flying, unfortunately. It's, it's, in the, uh, it's in the office. So in the next video, we check out the engineering simulator. And so where does the eSIM kind of play into the life cycle of testing this stuff? Does that come before you even fly the first plane? Definitely, or? yeah, definitely. So they will they'll come up with a, with a model of how the aircraft is meant to fly through a wind tunnel and, and computational fault fluid dynamic uh, analysis. They'll, uh, they, they come up with this model. Um, it's, it is essentially put into the system, into the eSIM. And through both the, the SITS and the eSIM, we use those two tools to wring out a lot of the systems that we can. So the avionic side of things and a lot of the inputs into that. The, you've probably heard of the Iron Bird or uh, an Iron Bird, which is an aircraft in all sense of the word, except for it doesn't go flying or it doesn't move. We, that's another rig, and that's used for all of the systems. So it's got all of the electrical harnessing throughout the entire rig. Uh, it's got um, masses to replicate uh, landing gear. It's got uh, things that spin to simulate the engines and the APU. It simulates a lot of it, but it's got all of the hardware in there. And that, that testing flushes out all of the systems side of things as well. So we get a really good appreciation then of the aircraft and how it's likely to fly and, and how it's likely to behave from the ISTCR, the SITS, the eSIM, before it actually goes into the aircraft and goes flying. So, um, and then, for instance, uh, say we get a new software load, a new avionic software load, we're going to run it through its paces in the, in the rigs, in the SITS, and in the uh, eSIM before it gets into the aircraft and go flying. We actually have to to run it through through our processes, run it through that to get a safety flight statement to say yes, it's ready, it's safe for flight, we're good to go. And how does one become, you know, a, a test pilot on a, a new business jet? Right. Uh, there's a couple of paths. Um, everyone is a little bit unique. The big two uh, differences is a lot of people go through the military and they go through a military test pilot school. So that's a great education. It's a, it's a way to uh, get uh, fantastic training over a condensed one-year period um, and then you know they'll they'll work some programs in the military and then when they end up getting out or retiring uh, they come to manufacturers such as ourselves uh, and the other branch is uh, all civilian um, and we from at various different times we have a, maybe you know a little more from one side or a little more from the other but it, there's uh, a bunch that are civilian and a bunch that are uh, military trained the civilian side is where I came from. My path was through engineering. I got a degree in mechanical engineering and then uh, got a job, worked at uh, Lockheed for a few years, came here as a flight test engineer, which at the time on the Learjets was also a co-pilot position. So it was uh, with a crew of two people, um, the pilot and the co-pilot flight test engineer. Um, I worked with uh, test pilot mentors and learn from them. So it was all on the job training, if you will, uh, and worked through many, many different programs over the years uh, to learn the different aspects of, of uh, flight testing. And there you have it. That's how you certify the world's newest and largest business jet.